basis set, for instance, when we use uh, a large basis set with diffuse functions, sometimes some elements are approximately combination of other elements. They are almost redundancies, and then it's uh, numerically difficult to obtain the inverse of the S matrix. In such cases, there is uh, an alternative method which is very interesting because um, you kill three birds with one stone. We will see why. <laughs> the idea is we will choose as a transformation matrix this matrix in which U is the matrix that diagonalize, diagonalize the overlap matrix. So we first have to diagonalize the overlap matrix by uh, transformation U. As small is the diagonal version. Then I take this transformation matrix, I will apply to my basis set this change of basis set. First, let's see that the new basis set has a uh, unit overlap matrix. It's very easy to, to show it because uh, well, this is uh, this is L and this is L adjoint yeah, because you have to take the product of the corresponding adjoints in the reverse order and of course uh, S, well, S is an Hermitian matrix. Yeah, S, uh, the diagonal S, of course, also it is. And uh, we have seen that the real function of an Hermitian matrix was also an Hermitian matrix. And so here we can put S to minus one half without the dagger. Yeah, we don't need to put the dagger here. And then finally, this is S, small s, and small s can be put as small s to minus one half, small s to minus one half, and then this is one, and this is one. Okay? Well, what's the interesting point here? The interesting point is that once, once we have diagonalized s, we can, for instance, order the eigenvalues in descending order. And then let's, let's assume that the space is n-dimensional, but the last k values are very small. Then what we can do is to neglect, to forget about these n eigenvalues, and take a smaller S matrix having only the non-vanishing terms, the, the terms that are not very small. And in matrix U, which is the matrix that diagonalizes S, I keep only the first N minus K columns. So, in fact, I have a transformation in which I start with n basis vectors, but this is the original basis set, and I obtain n minus k new basis vectors. Uh, so, for instance, the first element is the product of all the original vectors times this column. And same thing for the n minus k new basis set elements. The interesting point is, first, we have reduced the dimension of the basis set without almost losing any quality. The, the Hilbert subspace they span is almost the same because the values that we have neglected correspond to, base, to old combinations of these basis set elements that were almost redundant. So the 
quality of the calculation is almost the same. But we have a shorter dimension, we have an orthogonal basis set, and we have a faster conversions of SCF procedures because precisely sometimes the problems in convergence of the self-consistent field uh, iterations come from near uh, redundancies in the basis set. It is one possible origin of problems in convergence. Eh? So this is um, uh, an inst interesting way of transforming a basis set into a orthogonal, orthonormal basis set with less elements and almost the same quality, spanning almost the same space. Okay? Well, let's go. Well, these, these exercises are all of them very simple. Um, uh, since we have no more classes until, until January, uh, you, can, you can have a look and try to solve them. But uh, before going to Madrid, I will put the solutions so you can check. Yeah. Say in, in a week, I, I, let, I leave some time for you to think about it, but in, in a week I will, I will put the, the solutions. If I forget, let me know. Well, until now we have only considered discrete basis sets, but we can also use continuous basis sets. And some of them are very important and very useful. Uh, we have already said that when we represent, for instance, a vector in a discrete basis set, we have a collection of coefficients that can be put as a column matrix. But if the basis set is continuous, we have a continuous series of coefficients, and then these coefficients are not called coefficients, they are called wave functions. So the wave functions are nothing but the coefficients representing a state vector in a continuous basis set. For instance, it can be shown in my notes in Spanish and also in the book of Galindo y Pascual, it's, it's uh, proven that X is a complete set of commuting observables for a one-dimensional spinless particle and the same can be said of the momentum P. Mm. That means that the um, eigenstates of X or the eigenstates of P can be chosen as a basis set for the Hilbert space. And so we can represent a state vector by taking the scalar product with eigenstates of the position operator, which are normally written by putting only the corresponding value. And this is, this is how the wave function of the state psi is defined. Yeah. The wave function is the scalar product of the state vector times any eigenstate of the position operator. And same thing for momentum. The wave function uh, in the momentum space is the scalar products of the state vector time eigen states of the momentum operator. And uh, we know that the square of those coefficients is the probability density of obtaining the corresponding value when this property is measured and so we obtain the well-known bond interpretation of the square of the modulus of the wave function. It represents a probability density, eh? a probability a unit interval of the position axis, and this represents the derivative of probability with respect to P, that means 
the probability of finding the particle in a given differential interval in a scale of p, mm, of momenta. Mm. And um, it's very easy to transform from one representation to the other by using the uh, convenient um, resolution of the identity, for instance. Well, no, first, <laughs> we will speak later on of transformation between them. But first, how do we calculate the scalar product of two state vectors when we use position representation? Well, we can include here the identity in that basis set, the identity of the sum of the projectors. In this case, since we have a continuous collection of projectors, is not a sum but an integral of uh, over all the possible values of x. And then this with this is the wave function corresponding to the state psi prime. And this, with this, in reverse order, so we have to put an asterisk, is the wave function corresponding to psi. And so in the position representation, scalar products are obtained as integrals of the conjugate of the first term times the of the first wave function times the second wave function, etc. And of course, if we work in momentum representation, then we obtain the same thing, but now the integral is over the momentum values, eh, over the momentum matrix. Um, the representation can be diagonal, but when we speak of continuous representations, then the, the diagonal character of a representation is normally written in terms of the um, Dirac delta. Yeah? For instance, well, in general, for any operator A, the matrix elements, of course, this, are, this cannot be written in matrix form because the index are continuous, and so they are normally expressed as functions of two coordinates with, which are, in fact, the two indexes of the matrix element. Yeah. And uh, so we normally use this notation when we work with continuous representations. Mm. And in the particular case in which the matrix is diagonal, for instance, if we take the a matrix element of the position operator, since we are working precisely in the, in the basis set of eigenstates of the position, this is diagonal and this is expressed in this way which in fact is, is a direct generalization of what we write for uh, discrete basis sets. Yeah, for instance, when we say for a diagonal matrix, we have uh, Aig equals Ag times Kronecker delta Ij. And uh, the corresponding expression now is this one. Yeah. Instead of the Kronecker delta, we have the Dirac delta. Okay? <coughs> well, the Dirac delta can be defined in many ways. There is a lot of equivalent expressions for this delta. Uh, one of the, one, a very simple one is this, is this one, which is, again, uh, the, the equivalent for the continuous case of this, when we write something like this, uh, Ij, say, 
J and then here some um, some matrix for instance yeah. um, well, in order to make it similar let's put this yeah. we know that this delta is in a certain way cancel with the sum because the only non-vanishing term here is the one which has j equal i so we have a i the corresponding expression for continuous indexes is the integral of the delta for two indexes x prime x times a function of x prime integrated over x prime here was sum over j with the value of the function for x prime equal x here we obtain the value of a for j equal i it's exactly the same thing but for the continuous case well how do the more useful operators what is the, the expression when we work in position coordinates for instance let's apply the position operator to a given to some state vector and then multiply by an eigenstate x of the position operator this will be noted this way because it's in fact the wave function corresponding to this state so we put the state and parenthesis x to indicate that no this is a wave function corresponding to this vector well again to apply the operator we can put here the identity the resolution of the identity in position coordinates with x prime and then what we have here is these red terms we have just seen that since this is a diagonal matrix the result is the direct delta times x mm -hmm. And this, which is in blue, is the wave function at the point x prime. And so, by applying this, we obtain that the result is this function at x. So, it's what we have here. So, we have obtained a very well known result that is that. In position coordinates, the operator x uh, amounts to the effect of this operator is to multiply the wave function until we, um, until which we are applying the operator to multiply it by x. Yeah? X is a multiplicative vector in coordinate representation, and of course p should be a multiplicative vector in momentum representation hmm? which is what we have put here hmm? um, well the operator corresponding to to momentum can be chosen that way in fact this is the simplest way to choose this momentum in fact, the way to justify this expression is because if you calculate the commutator with x, we obtain, we obtain what should be, should be obtained according to the second postulate. We obtain that x px equal a h bar. So, in position coordinates, in position representation, x is a multiplicative vector. P 
is not univocally defined, univocally determined, because any two expression that fulfills the, the commutation rule given in the postulate, in the second postulate, could work uh, as well. Mm -hmm. But the simplest way to choose it can be shown to be this. In fact, if I take a more general definition in, in which here I add some, some function of x with certain restrictions, I don't remember exactly, you can see that, again, the commutation relationship is fulfilled, and so we could have chosen a more complicated expression for p, but the simplest way is to take this as zero. I don't remember now exactly which are the conditions of this function. It, it has to be a derivative or some other function. Uh, maybe in my notes I will speak of this point. And in the Raim de Pascual, you have the general expression of P. Yeah? But the simplest way, the one is shown in normal textbooks, is this one. Okay? Well, change. Now we, we will speak about changes between one representation and the other. You already know that the, to change from one to the other is uh, performed by uh, taking the Fourier transform. Why? The explanation is very simple. Hmm? Um, let me see. For instance, uh, it's a very simple question to show that in position uh, representation, the eigenstate, eigenstates of the momenta of the momentum are exponentials of ipx divided by h bar. So, the, you only have to apply this the expression we have put here, yeah, to apply this expression to that uh, wave function, and you see that it's an eigenfunction of P. So, these are the eigenfunctions of the momentum, of the momentum in the coordinate representation. Um, they can be shown to be orthonormal in the generalized sense of orthonormality that is obtained with uh, Kronecker delta instead of uh, Dirac delta. Eh? For instance, if you calculate the scalar product between two such functions, you obtain this. Eh? Of course, um, if P is different from P prime, the integral is zero because the real and the imaginary part of this integrand are sinus and cosinus functions. And if you integrate a sinus or a cosinus along the whole real axis, you have as many positive parts as negative parts, and so the integrals cancel out and you obtain zero. And if the P and P prime are equal, this, in, this is one because it's e to zero, and the integral of one is infinity. Yeah? Well, this is, uh, this is fulfilled by delta of Dirac. Delta of Dirac takes the value zero except in one point when the argument is zero, in which the value is infinity. But this is not enough to define a delta function. In fact, the delta function can be written as a sequence of functions that are, you can take, for instance, Gaussian functions or step functions with, um, which are narrower and narrower. And if the area Mm, um, uh, if there are in, uh, 
well, uh, the integral of the function is 1, and you take the limit for with tending to 0, then you obtain a direct delta function. Yeah. So there are many functions that converge to the direct delta function. And uh, one of them, uh, it can be shown that this is uh, an alternative definition of the delta function, which is equivalent to the one we have put in the previous slide. Well, so let's take a wave function in position coordinate, which is this scalar product, and introduce here the identity operator in coordinate in terms of coordinate projectors. Then here we have uh, well, let me raise a little So, this, uh, no, stoners, okay, see. this scalar product is the wave function corresponding to the state psi, and this is the conjugate of this. Because this is P. Uh, no, sorry, this is X P yeah, by definition of wave function. And here we have in the reverse order, so we have to add the asterisk. And so here we have the conjugate of this function which has been written here, this, and the conjugate which is obtained by changing the sign of the exponent. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this is precisely the definition of the Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. And same thing, if we start with the uh, we can obtain the position wave function starting from the momentum wave function. Then we insert a resolution of the identity in terms of project of um, momentum projectors, and we obtain a similar expression, except for here that we have a plus instead of minus sign, yeah? because then what we obtain here is directly this wave function. And the wave function of an eigenstate of P in position coordinates. Okay? What happens with direct products of state vectors when we work in a continuous representation? For instance, we want to calculate the wave function corresponding to this direct product. The wave function is obtained by taking the scalar product with, since we have two particles now, the eigenstates of the position are products of eigenstates of particle, of the position of particle one and the position of particle two. But by definition, we saw that this is calculated by multiplying the first part with the first part and the second times the second. And now this is the wave function corresponding to the first ket, the ket of particle one, and this is the wave function corresponding to the ket of particle two. So the scalar products no, sorry, the wave function corresponding to a direct product, a chronicle product, is the ordinary 
product of the corresponding wave functions. Eh? You take the wave function corresponding to particle 1 and the wave function corresponding to particle, to particle 2. You multiply them, you multiply them because now these are complex, ordinary complex numbers, and complex numbers can be multiplied by an ordinary product. You, you do not have to bother with uh, direct products. Yeah. Uh, the only way to multiply vectors from different spaces is the direct product. So we, sh we have to introduce it to obtain the general representation of the two-particle system. But when we work with, with wave function, we don't need we do not need to put the sign of the value product because this reduces to the ordinary product of complex numbers. Okay? <clears throat> well, and then, for instance, if we have a mono electron state, and we here I have used this notation for the four coordinates of position and spin of a particle, then the position representation of mono-electronic states are called spin orbitals. And if we consider only the spatial part of the mono-electron state, the representation in coordinates is called an orbital. So all the language of orbital spin orbitals refers to the position representation, coordinate representation of monoparticle states. Well, if, uh, of course, same thing for Slater determinants. If you take an antisymmetric product of monoelectron or in general monofermionic states and you express it in coordinate representation, you obtain what we call a Slater determinant. Sometimes we also use the word, the term Slater determinant for the vector itself, and not for the position representation of the vector, but also for the vector state itself. And I will use this terminology in the next part. Well, now here I have the notation I, I, I used in another course in which I used this for developing quantum chemistry methods, but that's enough. Yeah, so uh, let's, let me see, um, let's, um, Let's uh, stop here, yeah, because uh, next I will comment on second quantized or second quantization formalism, which in fact is nothing but a quite peculiar way of representing, is, a, is, is in fact the type of representation that is often used in quantum chemistry, in, for instance, when we are dealing with solids or with sometimes also for studying radiation theory, interaction between radiation and matter. And so this is a particular form of representing the states. And uh, since it's a different subject, we, we will make the break here. And in 10 minutes, we continue. OK? Any question? OK. Record. Okay. Um, well, now we will say a few words about the formalism that is uh, often used in quantum mechanics uh, uh, developments, mathematical developments, which is the second quantization formalism. Well, let's go. Uh, in standard quantum mechanics, time evolution preserves the norm of the state vector. We have seen that the unitary, the, um, 
time evolution operator is unitary, and unitary operators preserve scalar products. So, after some time, the scalar products between vectors is the same, and in particular, the scalar product of a vector by itself, which is the norm of the vector, is kept, and so if the state vector is normalized at some initial time, it will be normalized during the evolution. That means that the number of particles is conserved. If we have an n particle system, the system will be, we have n particles at any later time. But in fact, there are physical processes, processes in which the particles is not kept constant. Particles can be created and can be destroyed. For instance, uh, a gamma photon uh, of enough energy can be converted spontaneously into a, an electron plus a positron. Uh, so, two material, material parti uh, particles can be created from a photon and vice versa. They can be annihilated, they can be destroyed by giving, by giving uh, a gamma photon. Um, those processes must be studied in the, in the context of quantum electrodynamics, which is the quantum mechanics of electrons, positrons, and photons. And since there is an interplay between these three types of particles, the only way to understand this phenomena is by going to the quantum electrodynamics. But as in ordinary chemis chemical processes, we do not see that kind of phenomena because we do not deal with enough energies to create or to destroy even electrons, which are very light particles, then we can work with quantum mechanics for particles only. And, well, the, the only point in which uh, some aspects of quantum electrodynamics should be considered is the spect some spectroscopy phenomena. Yeah? Because in, when we are dealing with spectroscopy, electrons are kept, but the number of photons is not. Photons can be created by emission or can be destroyed by absorption by molecules. And in those cases, we have to the, the most uh, complete way of describing such processes is by using a quantum description of light, of electromagnetic radiation, in which we allow for the creation and destruction of photons. But for electrons, is completely unnecessary. However, some mathematical developments are, are performed in a easy way by using these, these operators. And that's why uh, they are often used in the context of quantum chemistry. And so we will, we will tell a couple of words of this formalism. So it's only for practical reasons. So it's not necessary to, to describe anything, any phenomenon that can that cannot be described without this formalism. But for practical reasons, sometimes it's convenient to use such uh, developments. In particular, for infinite systems, for instance, solids, and we will see why. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's go. <clears throat> okay. When we allow for creation and annihilation or destruction of particles, we need a wider Hilbert space. Because if we apply uh, creation of uh, or, uh, an electron creating operator to a given state, we obtain, we obtain a state of a system with one more electron. And so we we'll start for the space the anti-symmetric space corresponding to an electron to a new space 
of n plus 1 electrons. And so, when we use this formalism, in fact, we are working, we are working in, work, in what we call the focus space, which is the direct sum of the space of zero particles, the space of one particle, two particles. Eh? In our case, those particles are electrons, but the same can be done, in fact, for any uh, and, uh, for any fermion space or also for photon, eh? but we will develop only the version for fermions. Hmm? The state with no particles is a one-dimensional state or the space sorry, of zero particles <coughs> is a one-dimensional space having a basis vector which is the the, vac the vector describing a system with no particles. Yeah. It's called sometimes this way or this way since we use this letter for the states corresponding to n particles this will be the case for zero particles and this is different to the zero of the space. Yeah. The the zero vector is one thing, the vector with no particles is another thing. That's why uh, in the years before I used this notation for the, for the vacuum, normally it's called the vacuum state, yeah. and uh, now I have changed to this notation that is used I think in the Savo, and I like it because we do not put the zero inside, which can be um, can be confused with the the zero, eh? the zero element of any vectorial space. <coughs> well, let us choose a normalized squid basis set in H one. Eh? These are mono electronic states. In position representation, these are spin orbitals. Hmm? We choose any basis set, discrete basis set, and then we know that the Slater determinants yeah, uh, are a basis set in the n electron space. Hmm? They are antisymmetrized products of, of mono electronic states. Yeah? In general, we will use this notation for an n electron Slater determinant. Mm. So, the basis set of the focus space is formed by putting together the single basis set element of the vacuum state, the elements of the one electron Hilbert space, two electron Hilbert space, an electron Hilbert space, etc. Yeah. We have to collect all of these bases to obtain a basis set of the direct sum of these products. Yeah. In fact, these are subspaces of the Fock space. Yeah. In the same way, for instance, that we saw that the three-dimensional Hilbert space can be put as a direct sum of the plane yeah, let's see, the plane is one, is a two-dimensional space, the z-axis is a one-dimensional space, so we could say R3 is the direct sum of the plane plus the z-axis. Yeah? <clears throat> if we have a basis set here in the plane, for instance, together with a basis set in z, we have a basis set in R3. Yeah? Same thing here. <coughs> yeah, you know that um, in a direct sum, the subspaces only share one element, which is the, <coughs> the origin. Yeah? Same thing here. All of these subspaces has a zero, which is in fact common to all of them. Is the only common vector of all of these 
spaces. Okay? Well, then <coughs> um, in this context, we often use what we call the occupation number representation, <coughs> which is for a Slater determinant is nothing but a collection of numbers that are one for the occupied orbitals, that means the orbitals present in the determinant, and zero for the unoccupied orbitals, the orbitals of the basis set that, are, that, are, that do not appear in the determinant. For instance, the hartree fock the hartree fock determinant is built with the first spin orbitals, which are eigen functions of the Fock operator. Hmm? If we order all the spin orbitals in uh, <coughs> ascending order of energies, of, of eigen values, of orbital energies, then the I, the first n spin orbitals will be occupied and the rest will be unoccupied or virtual orbitals. Yeah? And so, in the occupation number representation, we have a collection of n ones and the rest of occupation numbers are zero. And this notation can be applied to any element of any subspace. Hmm? Of course, the sum of, of, the, of all the occupation numbers tell us which is the subspace to which this vector uh, belongs. Hmm. If we have that this sum is n, then we know that we are in a vector of this n electron space. Okay? <coughs> Of course, if we are dealing with fermions, occupation numbers can be only zero or one. But if we deal with bosons, occupation numbers can take any positive value yeah. because the, the sixth postulate does not limit the number of particles that can occupy a uh, state if the particles are bosons. Yeah. And uh, of course, the vacuum space in this representation is the space having all of the occupation numbers equal zero. Okay? <coughs> well, what's an annihilation operator? We defined the annihilation operator of an electron in the spin orbital psi i in the one particle state psi i in this way we take any occupation number any state of the focus space we put it in the occupation number representation and the result is this the only change is that if it's the annihilation operator corresponding to psi i, the occupation number of psi, psi i is changed by 1 minus n. Let's, uh, well, and there is a sign here which is minus 1 to the, to the sum, the sum of all the occupation numbers that are before i. Yeah? from j equal 1 until i minus 1. Let's consider some examples. For instance, if we apply the annihilation, the annihilation or destruction is the same, operator a sub 1 to this state vector, okay, having a 1 here. The result is 1 is changed to 1 uh, minus 1, so to 0. Then we have to multiply by n, which is 1. 
n by this minus 1 to the sum of all the m's which are previous to 1. Since there is no m previous to 1, this is 0, and so the sign is positive. Okay? What happens if here we have a 0 instead of a 1? Then, since we have to multiply by n, the result is 0. Hmm? If we applied A2 to a state having 0 here and 1 here, <coughs> okay, then again 1 is changed to 0, we must multiply, multiply by 1, and the sign is the sum of all the numbers which are preceding this one. In this case, we only have 0, so again the sign is a positive sign. Mm -hmm. But, if we apply A2 to a state vector having a 1 here, then this sum is this uh, is uh, what the sum in fact is one so we have to multiply by minus one which is the reason for this change of c okay well uh, in some physics books and uh, also sometimes in solid state books uh, you can find this notation but in ordinary quantum chemistry books, normally we use a notation in which we only write here the, say, the Slater determinant. We only put here the occupied spin orbitals. And so, if we translate this definition to this notation, which is more familiar in the quantum chemistry context, we see that if the later determinant contains the orbital, the spin orbital we are destroying, the result is a spin orbital in which we have not this column, it's a smaller determinant, of course, one column in one row smaller, and the, again we have a product here which can be, is the same as before, but we can also interpret it as the position number of the spin orbital we are destroying, minus 1. Also, an alternative, yeah, because the, since all of these are occupied, the sum of all the ends coincides with the position number of the orbital, minus 1 because the sum is over the preceding spin orbitals in the determinant. Um, also, it can be interpreted as the number of transpositions to move this orbital here to the first position. Hmm? Uh, so, if we destroy a spin orbital which is already in the first position, we have not to bother about the scene because the number of transposition then is zero. Mm? So, also we can consider that the, the annihilation operator always destroy, uh, destroy the orbital if it is in the first position of the determinant. And if it is not, we can move it to the first position and then destroy it. And this collection of movements uh, gives the sign we, we have here. Yeah. Every transposition implies a change of sign, a change of two columns of the determinant or two rows, and then a change of sign. Okay? Well, these are annihilation operators. What's a creation operator? Well, uh, creation, well, let's, let's one moment go back. So, except for the sign, for the sign, it's clear that the effect of an annihilation operator is if the 
schematical word present, it takes it off. And if it is not present, it gives zero. Yeah? It's clear because here, if n was 1, we change it to 0. If n was 0, we change it to 1. Yeah? So it creates if it is unexistent previously. Yeah? If not, it gives 0. It's uh, in a certain way, it's similar than, than the ladder operators, but here we have a very simple ladder of only two steps. Yeah? It can exist or non exist. Hmm? In fact, for bosons, we can have any number of any occupation number, and then the creation and annihilation operators then are very similar to the ladder operators of the angular momentum. Hmm? Well, <coughs> uh, well, by the way, um, the harmonic oscillator can be treated by using also creation and annihilation operators. There is a, uh, an application we can interpret the states of a harmonic oscillator as the ground state would be a state with zero particles. The first excited state is a state with a particle, a phonon. Eh? There is a, a novel similarity between the states of a harmonic oscillator and the state of radiation. The quantums of radiation are called photons, and the quantums of energy of a harmonic oscillator are called phonons, eh? because this can be applied to study, for instance, the vibration motion in solids, and then uh, we can say that when we give energy to the vibrational system, to the uh, vibration of the crystalline structure, we are giving, we are increasing the number of phonons. Yeah? So it's another application of the formalism. Well, let's go back to fermions. What is a creation operator of an electron in the spin orbit psi in the spin orbital psi i? Well, definition is given here. Again, we change this quantum number, this occupation number, to 1 minus ni. And we multiply by this factor. Let's consider some examples to see how it works. For instance, if we create an electron in the first position, that means in the first element of the mono electron basis set. If this element were not present, it appears, eh? it is created, and then we multiply by 1 minus n, which in this case is 1 minus 0 equal 1, and 2 minus 1, 2 mu, which is 0, so no change of sign. Hmm? If this spin orbital was already present, the result is zero, because here we multiply by one minus n. One minus one, now is zero. Okay? If we create an electron in the second position, and this position is free, we obtain, of course, and an, a slighter determinant with one more element, one more spin orbital, and in this case the sign is plus because we only have a zero before, but if we have a one before, then we have to add a minus sign here. Hmm? In fact, it's very easy to verify that any state for any correction of quantum numbers can be put, can be written as the result of applying to the vacuum state the collection of creation operators, which are, uh, if here, for instance, we have that the first n is 1, then we have to put here exponent n1. That means 
in the case of fermions, that means we put the operator. If this is zero, we do not put the operator. Eh? An operator elevated to, to zero is the identity operator. Eh? Of course, if we are dealing with fermions, then this is more interesting because this n can be any natural number. A slightly reverse notation. Again, if we create an electron in a position that was not non occupied uh, in the, the spin orbital was not present in the terminal, then it appears and with a sign that is also the number of transpositions to bring this from the first position to the corresponding position in the order the basis set. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can interpret that the creation operator always create the corresponding state in the first place of the determinant. And if we want to reorder this determinant in order to use a standard standard ordering, for instance, the ordering of decreasing energies, then we have to make a number of transpositions that gives this change of sign. Yeah. So an easy way to remember is this one. If we create in the first position, we have always a plus sign. If we want to move it to another position, we have to add the corresponding change of sign. And of course, if we create uh, an electron into a determinant in which the electron, the, the state was already existing, the result is zero. Yeah. Okay. This sign to differentiate the creation from the annihilation operator is due to the fact that the creation operator is the adjoint of the corresponding annihilation operator. Yeah. It's uh, easy to verify. Yeah. Uh, here, for instance, I have taken the result of applying the annihilation operator to any any uh, any state of the focus space in the occupation number representation, and then multiply, scalarly multiply, with any other element. If these are equal uh, to the corresponding relation, well, if this, sorry, if this is the adjoint of A, we have to, to verify that this is equal to this. If we take the operator to the first term of the scalar product, we obtain the adjoint. So to demonstrate this statement is equivalent to demonstrate this equality. But we only have to apply the definition of the annihilation and the creation operator. And then here, for instance, if we apply and multiply them scalarly by the first term, we see that this n must be the same as this n. This is an orthonormal basis set. So this scalar product, the scalar product between this term and this, this term of the basis set is zero unless they are the same. So the first number here must equal the first number here, etc., etc., and this must equal to this. And so the result is a product of Kronecker deltas, and in the particular case of the delta corresponding to index i, then n prime must be equal to 1 minus n. And uh, in the right-hand side, we obtain exactly the same. Eh? This must be equal to this, etc., and this must be equal to this. Eh? So, uh, this equality 
is really be really being uh, seen to be the same as this equality. Eh? And so the well, I, I have it here. Eh? Every, uh, the, the product vanish except when these all the numbers are equal except this one and this relationship is the same as this is this equality uh, oh I uh, uh, uh. oh no no <laughs> Mr. Liardo uh, this must be equal to this because this is now this is the first, the left hand side of the scalar product. Eh? So this must be equal to this. Eh? And this, so uh, n i must be 1 minus n prime i. Eh? And then we isolate this and we obtain the same relationship we have obtained here. Eh? We obtain this same result. Okay? Okay, so creation and annihilation operators with the same index are one of them is the adjoint of the other. Well, here I have a simple exercise of application of this formalism to obtain something that can be, of course, obtained without the formalism, but with this formalism, the, sometimes the deductions are simpler. Yeah? Here we consider one Slater determinant. Uh, it could be the Hartree Fock Slater determinant of an electro N electron system. And we consider a mono substitute substituted determinant. That means that we change one of the occupied orbitals by a virtual orbital psi k. Hmm? Well, then uh, of course, the spin orbitals are assumed orthonormal as, as usual when we are dealing with Hartree-Fock orbitals. And then we are asked to write the substituted determinant in terms of the, of the Hartree-Fock determinant by applying the proper creation and annihilation operators. I think it's rather intuitive how to do it. Eh? Of course, we have to destroy this orbital and then create this um, spin orbital. Eh? And then use the resulting expression to show that this scalar product is zero. Eh? That when we make a substitution, we obtain a new determinant which is orthogonal to the Hartree-Fock determinant. Eh? Well, is it's very simple, you can have a look, and I will give you the solution afterwards. Well, the product of uh, an annihilation, the result of applying an annihilation operator, and then the corresponding creation operator is called the number or the occupation number operators. Yeah, it's termed this way. Yeah. Why? It's very easy. Well, uh, you have here the deduction. You can try to follow it. It's very simple. Uh, the result is that the, the, these states in the occupation number representations are eigenstates of Ni with eigenvalue, the corresponding number. And so, the result of applying this operator is to extract in the occupation number. In fact, this is, in the case of fermions, this is an operator that has only two eigenvalues, one or zero. And in fact, it's a projection operator. Well, we, we will see it in a minute. And the sum of all the occupation numbers for all the one particle states is called the electron number operator. And the physical uh, meaning is very simple. Eh? If we apply N to one of these sketches, 
we obtain the sum of the n i's and the sum of the n i's is the number of electrons that are occupied in this state, in this Slater determinant. Okay? Um, well, it can be shown that these operators are commuting non-orthogonal projection operators hmm, and that one of them projects onto the subspace spanned by the slit by the slater determinants containing psi i. So it's it's very clear. It gives zero for any determinant non-containing the orbital and one for the slater determinants containing this spin orbital. And so it projects onto a subspace made of all the determinants containing psi i. <clears throat> For any state, not only a later determinant, eh? any state of the Fokker space, if we take the expected value of the number, the occupation number operator, eh? Since we can write a new state as a linear combination of the later determinants, hmm? well, it's an n electron state. Hmm? So here we take a linear combination of only n electron determinants. Hmm? We are now working in the subspace corresponding to n electron states. Hmm? Then we, this is the configuration interaction expansion of the state in terms of determinants, then we expand this and this, and then we apply here the definition of n that gives the number of electrons. Well, uh, no, no, sorry, this is an individual n, so it is 1 if the, orb the spin orbital is contained in this determinant and zero otherwise, so <coughs> this sum <coughs> can be restricted to only the determinants containing the state i. Hmm? And so uh, then the, well, the eigenvalue for them is one, and here we have a product that vanishes unless the two determinants are coincident, in which case this scalar product is 1, and so at the end we obtain that one of the sums is disappears with this Kronecker delta, and then we obtain the sum of the square of the coefficients corresponding to the determinants containing i. And this is called the occupation number of the spin orbital i in any n particle states. Yeah. The occupation number for a Slater determinant can only be 1 or 0. But the, but the occupation number for any other state, for instance, for a configuration interaction wave function, can be any any number between 1 and 0. Of course, in general, this is less than 1, because here we are not summing, we are not summing to every determinant. We are only selecting here the determinants containing i. Hmm? Well, uh, these numbers are called, as I said, population. This is the population of the of a given spin orbital in an arbitrary an electron wave function, an electron state. <coughs> okay, some properties of these operators. The fermion creation and annihilation operators fulfill some anti-commutation rules. The anti-commutator is normally 
term with a plus sign here. Also, sometimes it's written that way. <coughs> this is defined as AB plus BA. Same thing as the commutator, but, but with a plus sign. It's um, easy to verify. Well, this, I, I won't do the demonstrations here, which is quite boring, but all of them are in the notes. Well, this is not in the Spanish notes I put in the, in the Google, but I've written it in English, and I've put in the full, uh, the full text is available in the Google. Eh? And the uh, demonstrations are, most of them are done in, the, in, in those notes. Okay? For instance, it can be shown that any pair of uh, annihilator and a creator, the corresponding anticommutator is the Kronecker delta. So the anticommute if the indexes are different, and the anticommutator is one if they have the same index. And any pair of annihilation or creation operators anticommute. The anticommutator is always zero. From here, we really obtain that whenever we invert the order of two creation of two annihilation operators, we have to add a change of sign. And same thing for creators. Yeah. We can commute these operators, but for every uh, transposition, we have to add a minus sign. And if the operators are of different type, we have to take K because if we invert the order, we, we have to put a Kronecker delta minus the operator in the reverse order. If the indexes are different, then they anticommute. If they are equal, they not. We have a, a, a one minus the other way around. Hmm? A trivial consequence of this relationship eh, when we apply it to the same index is that AI AI equals uh, equals minus a i a i and the only way that an operator equals its opposite is that the operator is zero hmm? so if we which is a, a trivial result from a physical point of view because of course we cannot create two fermions in the same state so if we apply two times the creation operator we must obtain zero Well, another exercise, hmm? use the question number representation of later determinants to show that if I have a product of two of later determinants, the result is zero unless the spin orbitals here are the same, but they can be in the same order or in the reverse order. So the general way of expressing the result is this way. Hmm? Think about it, and here's a hint of how to solve it by using creation and annihilation operators. <coughs> well, the usual operators that appear in many electron theory can be put in terms of creation and annihilation operators. For example, for example, the standard non-relativistic Hamiltonian, which has a one particle term, which includes kinetic energy and attraction, coulombic attraction by the nuclei, and the bi-electronic term, 
which, in, which includes the electronic repulsion, these operators can be put by using second quantized formulas. Well, just, just a question. Um, why it is called second quantization? Eh? The reason, I think, <laughs> comes from the study of radiation. Radiation theory is a wave theory in classical electrodynamics. And, we, and when you go to a quantum theory of radiation, you obtain a quantized version of radiation in which, well, to study this uh, quantum theory of radiation, you need to use curation and annihilation operators of them. They are boson operators because photons have spin one, so they are bosons. And then we go from a classical wave theory to a quantum discrete theory. And uh, here we are applying creation and annihilation operators of a quantum theory and then we start from wave functions and we end to a discrete description in which we, we, we speak of occupation numbers instead of wave functions. And I think that's the reason why they use this term, uh, not very convenient in my opinion, but second quantized formalism, because we apply some type of quantization to a theory was, that was already quantum theory. Eh? Well, in fact, it is not nothing new, nothing different. It's only a practical way of obtaining some results as we know be seen here, for instance, for the case of the Hamiltonian of an N electron system. Well, in the notes that are in the Moodle, it seems that this Hamiltonian can be written in this way. Yeah? Here we have a sum over all the basis elements of the, all the spin orbitals, of all the one particle states of these uh, matrix elements times uh, a creator and the annihilator operator. And for the dielectronic term, you have a sum, again, of some terms which are dielectronic integrals. And here we have a product of two creator and two annihilator operators. Yeah. You can see in the notes that this is equivalent to this. In fact, uh, strictly speaking, <laughs> This is an operator in the Fock space, and this is an operator in the subspace, which is the antisymmetric product of the non-electronic states. So, in fact, this works in the subspace of the Fock space. Eh? So, strictly speaking, this is the projection of this one in the subspace of n electronic states. Well, but they are equivalent, they contain the same information. And uh, the interesting point of the second quantized version of the operator is that you have no reference, no explicit reference to the number of electrons. You have the same expression, no matter which is the number of electrons. And this is particularly useful when the number of electrons is infinite, as in the case in solids, in, in any periodic system. Yeah? In fact, where is the number of electrons? The number of electrons is hidden um, in the states, because if we take, for instance, the expected value of this operator in an n electron determinant, then the sum of the occupation numbers is n, and so 
the number of particles appears because the states with which you are working contains, uh, if you use, for instance, the occupation number representation, you have that the sum of all the ends must be the number of electrons. But this number does not appear explicitly. And so sometimes it's easier to, sum, to make the mathematic, mathematical developments in second quantized when we are working with infinite systems. But even for finite systems, sometimes it's a practical way of making some deductions and it is often used in treatments of couple uh, cluster theory or configuration interaction theory and so on. Hmm? Well, of course, since we are not considering physical phenomena in which the number of particles varies, of course, we always find the same number of curation and annihilation operators because these operators always work within a subspace with a fixed number of particles. Hmm? But exception for photons in spectroscopy which have the particular boson, curator and annihilation operators. Hmm? Well, for instance, Hartree Fock energy, we take this expression of the Hamiltonian, we apply it to the Hartree Fock later determinant, and then we obtain this expression of the Hartree Fock energy, in which there is no explicit reference to the number of electrons except that these states, well, in fact, I have here put the N, but uh, I, I could use, I could have used this notation in which N does not appear, but of course it is implied here. Yeah? The sum of the occupation numbers should give N. Hmm? Well, and then, um, for instance, all the Slater quantum rules can be can be proven in a quite convenient way by using this notation. For instance, if we have here a matrix element of one electron Hamiltonian, this is a matrix element of the operator, one electron operator, then we take, for instance, the diagonal elements. I take here the determinant and the same determinant. Then you can see that if you put this operator here, you have to change the creation to the annihilation one because they are adjoined between themselves. And then here it is clear that the sum can be restricted only to occupied orbitals because if R or S is not present, is not occupied in Psi, in phi, then this is zero. So first, the sum can be restricted to occupied. I have changed the indexes to A and B to stress that we only consider occupied orbitals. Then I move back this operator to the right-hand side, and I see that here, of course, B must be contained here. And if A is different from B, then the result here is zero. Uh, because A is also an occupied orbital. And so if we create an electron in a determinant in which this, if we create a spin orbital here and this spin orbital was already occupied, the result is zero. So from this double sum, we found that A must equal B. And in this case, if we take one of the occupied orbitals, we destroy it and we create it, in fact, this is the occupation number. And since this is 
the orbital psi i was occupied, the occupation number is 1, and at the end we obtain the same result that uh, was found by others, other was deduction in, in, in another way by using the Slater common rules. Hmm? Well, this is an example of application and just to finish, um, just a, a, a brief comment about particles and holes. Hmm? Uh, creation and initial papers are sometimes referred to the Fermi vacuum of Fermi C. That means that instead of starting from the from the sorry instead of starting from the vacuum state and applying creation operators to obtain any other state, sometimes we we'll start from the Hartree Fock determinant. And then we, instead of giving all the series of creation operators to obtain any other determinant, yeah, say an N electron determinant, yeah, by applying here the a series of creation operators, then we consider the vacuum as the Slater determinant, the ground, the lowest energy determinant, and then only specify the variations that we introduce here to obtain other determinants. For instance, if we want to, to write a mono-substituted determinant, then we have to <coughs> create an electron in the corresponding, uh, well, we have to, to create a hole in this Fermi C, in this vacuum, and an electron in, an, in, a, in a state that was unoccupied. Yeah? And so, um, this is particularly useful for solids, again, because with this notation, we should have to put here an infinite collection of operators. And if we start as, as a reference state, as a starting point, the Fermi vacuum of the Fermi C, that means the Slater lowest energy Slater determinant, then we, with this formalism in which we create holes and particles, then we only need to specify the operators for the differences of any determinant with respect to the lowest energy or high form determinant. Okay? And then there is a language of, for instance, excitons eh, to refer to a neutral pay formed by a hole and an electron. Eh? That means when we excite an electron, we create, we can say, we destroy an occupied electron and create an electron in a virtual state. Or, alternatively, we can say, we create a hole in the sea and we create simultaneously an electron in an excited state. Yeah? And uh, this can be considered as a pair of a positive particle and the negative particle. The negative particle is the electron created in the virtual state, and the positive particle, in fact, is the Fermi C in which you have created the hole. So, the, 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 this state would be a state in which you have n minus one electrons, and, of course, there must be also n nuclei, because this is a molecule or a system or a solid, and then, in practice, this C acquires a positive charge. And so we can study some properties of the cited state as properties of a two-particle system. A positive charge, a positive um, quasi-particle, and an electron. Okay? Okay, I think that's all.
Let me. Ah. Okay, this is the last one. So try to have a look to the to the exercises. I will give the solutions, and since part of my final score must be based in some exercise, not only in the exam, I will put you uh, an exercise to solve and to give me the solution in paper solution in Madrid and uh, the exercise will be a model of the exam you will have a series of exercises which are very similar to the ones we have done here in the exam you can use any documentation you, you like of course in the exercises you will do at home same thing. Eh? So you don't have to, to remember any expression. You have all the material you want. But I will give you an exam to show the type of, of exam we can have. And then you solve it and you give me the result. The, the. I, I think the best thing is to solve it by hand. Don't bother in, in making a very nice presentation. I prefer that you spend time in Solving and understanding, not in the presentation, and you can do it by hand and give me it in Madrid. Okay? Any question? If you have questions these days, you can you can send me a message and I will try to, to answer you. Yeah, maybe not at the same moment, but okay. So thank you very much. Have nice holidays and see you on Madrid. Bye. <clears throat>